Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. If you love the games, we are the show for you. Each week we share stories from the athletes and people behind the scenes to help you have more fun watching the games. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? Happy tercentury. Huh? It's our 300th show. <gasps> oh, yes. It's our 300th show. It's amazing. It is our tercentary. Tercent. Wait, I wrote it down. <laughs> tercentary. That's not even French, and I'm struggling with it. <laughs> well, you know, it's our 300th regular show. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because we don't number the dailies and a couple of the specials that we've done, but that's pretty cool. It is cool. It's hard to believe it's been that long it feels like we've been doing the show a very long time but it also feels like no way has been 300 episodes i know it's and a long time and we're still here and you know people always ask us oh, the games are like every four years what do you talk about and i tell you our list has not even begun to diminish i think it's i know 300 bigger. we've got 3,000 more <laughs> topics we could talk about buckle up listeners speaking of great topics to talk about we are getting into rhythmic gymnastics today which is very exciting because you may understand my ambivalence about the sport but we've got a guest who might change my mind Blythe Lawrence is with us today. She is a freelance sports journalist and commentator. You may have recognized her voice from many an OBS and gymnastics feed. So we talked with Blythe about many things, so many that we've got two shows worth for you. But we are starting with rhythmic gymnastics today and how they work. Take a listen. So let's talk some rhythmic gymnastics and why we should love it. Let's start with just the really basics of why should we all be watching rhythmic gymnastics? It's beautiful. And gymnastics, I really like saying that it's something that lies at the nexus of sport and art. And maybe rhythmic gymnastics, you can really see the art just as much as you see the athleticism. So first of all, it's spectacular to look at. It has people telling stories on the carpet. It has thrilling tosses and catches. There's always that suspense. The same suspense is when you watch a balance beam routine, like are they going to fall? Or are they not going to fall? Are they going to make this catch? Is there going to be a heartbreaking moment where on the last throw, the apparatus gets away from you? And there's just so much drama and intensity in something like an all-around final in rhythmic gymnastics, where you have gymnasts that take the carpet with each of the handheld apparatus, wearing something different, doing a completely different routine. There's a lot of potential for things to go wrong, for mishaps to happen. And, you know, it just, like with any athlete, it means so much to them. It, it's such a glorious thing to watch. But then afterwards, you're like, oh, you know, that... <laughs> <laughs> you you kind of sit back and you go, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it's a brilliant thing. It, it takes you on a journey. What makes it hard? Have you ever tried it? Well, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's one of those things that people look at a little bit and they're like, oh, well, that looks easy. But with so much of gymnastics, it looks easy because of all of the time that has been invested into refining and perfecting those moves. It's not easy at all. And so when you come to realize how very difficult it is to make something look that easy, your respect for it just shoots way up. And you think, wow, this is an extraordinary sport. And it is an extraordinary sport. I always love the choreography of the team event. So there's a team and there's solo. So let's talk a little bit about the team event. How is it put together? What are we going to see? 
to be honest with you, I do not know how they managed to put together the group exercises because there is like in artistic gymnastics, there's a code of points and there are a lot of things and it really becomes very nuanced about what you can do and what you cannot do. And if you do A, you can only do A twice, except if B, and then, you know, and if B, then C. But it is a thing that's just, it's incredibly nuanced, both for individuals and for groups. And I've never talked to a group choreographer, but I would love to pick their brains and say, you know, how, what is, how do you even start to do this? And how much time does it take between, you know, your starting point and your ending point? Because I think it's, it's a lot of hours. And then making sure maybe once you've got the basic concept of what the routine is going to be about and how things are going to go down, you have to refine that a little bit to make sure that you're optimizing the difficulty that the group can get within the limits, of course, of what the group can do. And it's just, it's very, very complicated. Who are the big guns to watch? At the moment, Italy is really at the top of the world in rhythmic gymnastics. And the reason is they've got a 19-year-old named Sofia Raffaelli, who is the world champion. She won five gold medals at the last world championships. And she is spectacular. She has a wonderful way of handling the apparatus. She's incredibly well coached. She's coached by a 2012 Olympian named Giulietta Cantalupi, who has just such a wonderful presence in the, the kiss and cry uh, when she's interacting with her athletes as well. And she really, really knows what she's doing, both technically and mentally preparing her athletes for competition. The Italian group is absolutely formidable as well. They have two routines that are iconic. People are going to be watching them 50 years from now and going, wow, isn't that great? The same way that we do today. Yeah. And then Bulgaria as well is maybe the other big hitter both for groups and individuals. They have three phenomenal individuals right now in Stiliana Nikolova, who was the splash of last year's world championships and of the European championships this year. And then the European champion in title, Boriana Kalain, also from Bulgaria. She she had a difficult end to her 2022. The world championships were in Sofia, in her hometown. It was like tailor-made for her to have a career making competition. And she's somebody who has placed fourth at a lot of international competitions. She's always been up there, but she's never quite gotten onto the podium at a world championships. And the day of the competition, she had a terrible infection and she had to be hospitalized. She actually came to the venue and was warming up and was just too sick to compete and, and withdrew. And it was like this amazing shock when it was announced in the arena that she was withdrawing without ever having taken the floor. And it must have been just gutting for her to have to deal with that. But she's recovered and she's back this year. She took the European title, which was huge. And she's looked amazing. Israel as well. They are incredible. Even after the retirement of Lenoy Ashram, they have so many promising individuals, and one who's actually making a comeback this weekend named Daria Atamanov, who was the European champion in 2022. And she was injured as well at the World Championships, like five minutes before she was supposed to perform her first routine. It was a really shocking day at that, at that World Championships. And everybody's so excited to see her back. And just, yeah, there's opportunity in rhythmic gymnastics like there never has been before. And we've got nations like Brazil and Mexico that are recording historic results. So it's a very exciting moment. What kind of injuries do you see in rhythmic? Ankles, some knees, some hips, some back problems. Rhythmic in the 80s and 90s was really based on flexibility. It's not so flexibility heavy now, but you've still got balances and splits and things like that that the gymnasts have to do in order to bolster their difficulty. And they take a toll. Much like, say, mm, a ballerina might have certain hip back injuries later on in their career. So what is the focus today? The focus today is on balances, on pivots, on leaps, and on what you can do 
and how much you can do in terms of things like turns and rolls and leaps while the apparatus is in the air. So every routine, you will have like two or three really large catches and throws where the gymnast just lobs the apparatus towards the ceiling and then executes, say, three Chenet turns and a forward roll or two back walkovers and two Chenet turns and then catches the apparatus while doing an illusion turn that kind of thing. The basis of rhythmic gymnastics is about when it comes to building your difficulty, these sort of things that you are able to do while you are also manipulating the apparatus. So for example, you throw the apparatus and then you do a series of turns and you do maybe a change of level, which would be like a roll or something like that. And then if you can catch or throw the apparatus while you're in the midst of doing something else, like a walkover or an illusion turn or something like that, then you get even more bonus points. And so it becomes very intricate and it becomes about how much detail you are really able to do. And once you understand that, the sport becomes a lot clearer. I don't know why they would get hurt because they have no bones. <laughs> It's a lot of stretching in order to get to that point. Yeah, just, just a lot of stretching, a lot of bar work. So one of the things we saw in Tokyo was a lot of scoring controversy. What was that about and do you expect to see it again in Paris? Anytime an apparatus is dropped, it's the equivalent of having a fall from something like the high bar or the balance beam. And the thing that really grated on a lot of people in Tokyo was that Lenoy Ashram dropped her ribbon momentarily about two thirds of the way through the routine. Now, unlike artistic gymnastics, it's like in artistic, if you have a fall, you are docked one point and that's the end of the story. In rhythmic, how much you are deducted if you drop the apparatus basically depends on how many steps you have to take to retrieve the apparatus. So if you lose the hoop, and then you have to go chasing across the carpet to regain the hoop. Like you're going to lose a certain number of tenths for every step you take. And also if you have to go out of bounds to retrieve the hoop and, and that kind of thing. But while there is a, a standard deduction for just if you drop it and then you can just pick it up without having to take any steps, it's a fairly small one. And that's what happened to Ashram. She didn't have to, you know, take three lunges in order to regrasp the ribbon. She just bent down and picked it up again. So the deduction, while it was obvious that she'd made a mistake, wasn't that bad, to be honest. But it's one of those things where a lot of people maybe judge things a bit subjectively. Um, and it's easy to do that in rhythmic. But once you look at the code of points, you can see where certain deductions are. Certain deductions for, say, how you grip the ball when you catch it or how you grip the hoop. Your wrist actually has to be a certain way to avoid deductions. So these things, they can be really hard to spot if you are kind of a lay person who's just turned on the TV at the Olympics, but they are there and the judges know how to spot them. And that was really one of the things that made the difference in, in Tokyo in the all-around competition. And there was a lot of scoring protests as well that really slowed down the competition. What, <laughs> what is a protest and how does that work? You can protest your difficulty score, more or less. It's a little more complicated than that. But if you think that the judges have missed a sequence of difficulty or you haven't been given credit for a sequence of difficulty and you don't understand why, you can. You have a, a limited amount of time to formally lodge a protest and to have your routine reviewed. And a lot of gymnasts and a lot of nations tend to do this because sometimes the score is raised. Sometimes the judges really have missed something, and so it's worth having it reviewed. And sometimes they do it just maybe because they think that they might receive an increase in their score. And routines in rhythmic are so complex that it's understandable, actually, if the judges do miss something. And the athletes and the coaches who know their routines and what they do inside out, I think, have cause often to say, hey, you know, I did this and you didn't see it. And so I'd like it reviewed. And so the result is a lot of scoring inquiries in group competition as well. Other thing. 
Can we talk about the costumes a little bit? <laughs> In the old days, rhythmic gymnasts used to just wear leotards. Very simple. And now they are feathered and beaded and bedazzled to the hilt. Is Do you think that makes the sport less serious in terms of how spectators take it? No, I, I don't. And the reason is because you can say the same thing of artistic gymnastics leotards. You look at the leotards the U.S. women were wearing in 2016, and there were articles that were being done on how many crystals and the, you know, like the custom fits that they went through while the leotards were being made and things like that. And I think that it enhances the artistic component of rhythmic gymnastics. A gymnast often in a routine is playing a character or performing to a certain theme about something. And so it seems normal that she would wear something that plays up to that. And yes, the leotards, you might argue, are as much works of art as the routines themselves. I know that a lot of the leotards are custom designed and handmade and used like Swarovski crystals and are really preserved after the Olympic Games. There's at least one that has gone into the Olympic Museum. And they're just really beautiful. And when you think about rhythmic gymnastics as a craft, like the entire sport, the creation of these routines, the way that they're performed, the music that's chosen, and the leotards, it all seems rather pieces of a certain whole. And what you get out of it is the whole artwork. What apparatuses are they using for Paris? So in individual, the apparatus are the four that are the most common, the hoop, the ball, the clubs, and the ribbon. They used to use the rope in rhythmic gymnastics, but for the past couple Olympic cycles, the rope has been out. It still exists in the junior divisions, but in the seniors, they don't use that anymore. And then it will be for Paris, five of, there will be two group routines. So five of one apparatus, and then there will be a, what they call a three plus two routine. So it will be three of a second apparatus plus two of, again, a, a, another apparatus. So like right now, the group routine is five hoops, and then the three plus two is three ribbons and two balls. So for Paris, it will be the group exercises will be one with five hoops, and then the second one with three ribbons and two balls, just like now. That's really complicated just because of the properties. I mean, you've got a ball that's heavy and this ribbon that will like float in the air. Absolutely. And often organizers get a bit finicky about the air conditioning in an arena during a, a ribbon competition. So there have been competitions in rather hot places where they have actually turned off the air conditioning for the ribbon competition because the gymnasts and the coaches don't like it if you've got air blowing from a certain direction. It, it throws off what they do with the ribbon. Do you have a favorite apparatus? Oh, oh no. No, that's difficult. I really like them all, honestly. Maybe the most memorable for a lot of people is ribbon. A ball can be so elegant and so interesting. Clubs is always interesting. And the things that people can do with clubs is just amazing. And hoop also, you can get a lot of very poignant performances with the hoop. So no, no favorite. Are particular countries good at particular apparatus? Mm, that's difficult. I wouldn't say so, no. Sometimes, and only sometimes, it seems like particular gymnasts are particularly good with particular apparatus. But again, unlike an artistic, where you can kind of pick out apparatus sometimes and say, well, you know, China is very good for being known. China is known for being very good on the uneven bars and that kind of thing. It's not necessarily the case with rhythmic, I don't think. If you want people to fall in love with, rhythm, with rhythmic gymnastics, are there routines that you can point to, say, over the past few years that you said, watch this, you, you will not believe this? There are so many, so many. At the moment, if you want 
your jaw to just be on the floor or you want your friend's jaw to just be on the floor. I think that you could show them just about anything from the last world championships and they'll go, wow. Because that's what we were doing. <laughs> Do different countries have different styles? Hmm. Somewhat, I think, yes. But that's as much about perhaps who they're being coached by and who they're being choreographed by than about actually being known for this style of dance and so doing routines that incorporate this style of dance. We see that a little bit, but not as much as you'd think. Is there a piece of music that you're tired of? (laughs) No, there isn't. But there are pieces of music that tend to be very popular amongst rhythmic gymnasts. Things from the ballet Carmen, Bolero, the soundtrack to the movie Gladiator. There's a fair amount of Michael Jackson. Gosh, anything else? No. But really at every world championships, you hear Carmen two or three times at least. It's like figure skating. Carmen (laughs) just will not go away. It's a piece of music that speaks to so many people and is so versatile. You can do so many things with it. Now, rhythmic gymnasts are getting a bit more contemporary. One of the most show-stopping routines at the moment is by Brazilian Barbara Domingos, who does uh, a cut of Lady Gaga to her ribbon routine. It's bad romance, but with a different vocalist. And it starts and stops. It's a little kooky. It's very interesting. What have we missed talking about for Rhythmic that people should know and get excited about for next year? I think the passion of the gymnasts and the way that they strive to qualify, whether it's for world championship finals or for the Olympic Games. And aborting an Olympic qualification process is always something that is difficult And you can really easily lose sleep over it, over how you approach it. And this quadrennium in particular, there are several rhythmic gymnasts who are vying for qualification. And you can just see that it means the world to them to be able to potentially call themselves Olympians. And the way that they have constructed their routines and the way that they are competing those routines and the pressure that they are under is just so, it's a lot. And the way that they rise to it and perform is also something that is almost as beautiful to watch as watching the routines. They're putting themselves out there. They're taking huge amounts of risk. They're investing so much of their lives into this dream. And it all comes out on the carpet when they perform those routines. And it's some of the most emotional play in all of sports. And that's what really captures me, in addition to the the beauty of the routines, but the stories that have gone into the making of those routines and the getting to that moment. Do you think we'll see an American make it to Paris. Yes. (laughs) I I think we might see in the individual competition, two Americans in Paris. And who are they? The Americans to watch at the moment, Evita Griskanis, the 2020 Olympian who had a top 15 finish at the Tokyo Games, and uh, Lily Mizuno, uh, a phenomenal young gymnast who has really come up over the past few years as an individual. She actually competed as an individual and was number three or number four in the U.S. for quite a lot of the 2010s. And then she joined the group and she did the Olympics as the group, as a member of the group in Tokyo, and now has gone back to individual competition. And she is so interesting too, because she said that that transition from individual to group and back to individual, she was like, it's like a different sport. You know, my body felt completely different and the things that you have to emphasize and focus on when you're doing group and when you're doing individual are not at all the same thing. And so she's somebody who is extremely exciting to watch as well. Blythe Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Blythe. You can follow Blythe on Twitter. She is at underscore Blythe Lawrence. And on Insta, she is Rose Blythe Lawrence. We will have the rest of Blythe's interview talking about the other gymnastics disciplines in a few weeks. So be on the lookout for that. 
We would also like to give a special thank you to our patrons who keep our flame alive every month. Our monthly episode with Changes for Paris 2024 is coming out soon. So check out flamealivepod.com slash support to make sure you get it. If supporting us now through Patreon is not an option, but you'd still like to give some love to us, tell a friend about the show. And we will also have a Kickstarter in the fall to help us get to Paris 2024. Couldn't have done 300 episodes without the Patreon support. Exactly. Now is the time of the show where we have our history moment. All year long, we are looking at Seoul 1988 as it is the 35th anniversary of those games. Allison, it is your turn for a story. What do you got for us? Very excited about this story because I did not remember this. And when I read it, I did. Once I read it, I said, oh, I got to share this. So we're going to talk today about the 100 meter men's butterfly. Okay. Sounds like it's very specific and wouldn't have much to talk about, but oh no, you'd be wrong. <laughs> so in the run up to the games, Pablo Morales was the world record holder and the 84 gold medalist. I remember it, Pablo. Big yes. deal. Big deal for little swimmer Jill. Absolutely. But Pablo didn't make the team at the Olympic trials. So that we knew we we're going to have a new gold medalist, but that did not leave the field empty. We had Michael Gross, the albatross oh, from West yeah. Germany. Yes, yeah. known for his long arms and amazing win wingspan. And you had American star Matt Biondi, mm -hmm. who at this point in his career already had five gold medals. He went on to have a total of 11 Olympic medals. He was really expected to come out on top of this race. Also in the pool was Anthony Nesty from Suriname. He was born in Trinidad and Tobago, but his family emigrated to Suriname when he was a child, and he attended high school and college in Florida, which is where hmm. he really did most of his training. So we get to the finals. At the start, Michael Gross purposely false starts, which was very common at the time because that first false start did not disqualify you. Right, right. It just psyched the other people out. So he gets out of the pool. Everyone is booing at him for having false started. Okay, race starts for real. Matt Biondi takes the lead for the first 50. He's on world record pace. With about 20 meters, 20, 30 meters to go after the turn, Biondi is a half body length ahead of the field. Looks like he's going to cruise in for an easy gold medal. No, no, no. Over in lane three, Nesty pushes from behind. At the very last split second, Biondi makes an error. He got caught between strokes at the finish, so he could either do a half stroke or a glide. He chose to glide, and you Nesty reaches for the wall, wins the race by one hundredth of a second. Wow. You never choose the glide. You never. I know that. And, and I can tell you when you are in that position... It is a hard decision to make, and you got to make it really quickly. But when you choose the glide, it just slows you down. Like you, you have to have a comfortable lead to do that glide. Biondi is crushed. He is the last to leave the pool <gasps> after the race. He's comforted by Michael Gross, who finished fifth. So both of them had what? a disappointing race. But I will say, on the podium, Biondi was incredibly gracious and not a sore loser and very happy. Nesty, needless to say, was a hero in his country. He is the only medalist in any sport from Suriname to this day. Wow. He has planes named after him. The National Stadium is named after him. And for a while, his his face appeared on the 25 Florin banknote. Get out of town. Currently, he is the head coach at his alma mater, the University of Florida, where he coaches both the men and the women. And he was an assistant coach for the men's team in Tokyo. Oh, wow. For the U.S. And Nesty also, as a coach, served as a flag bearer for Suriname at the opening ceremonies in Beijing in 2008. Welcome to Shukflistan. Now is the 
time of the show where we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are get past guests of the show and also listeners who make the, up the citizenship of our country of Shuklistan. Last week, we didn't have much. All of a sudden, we've got some news. <laughs> Felicity Passon competed at the World Aquatics World Championships. She finished 41st in the 100-meter butterfly and 50th in the 100-meter backstroke. Doesn't sound too great, but as in, but in terms of continental results, butterfly was second and backstroke was fourth. I don't know what all the qualifiers are like for swimming, especially coming from Africa, but when I looked at that, I saw, oh, she might still be able to get in. All depends on exciting. her times. Mm -hmm. Pole vaulter Katie Moon, hammer thrower Deanna Price, and race walker Evan Dunphy are on the start lists for the World Athletics World Championships in Budapest, which runs August 19th through the 27th. So go Shuklistan. Aaron Jackson was named to Team USA for the 2023 World Inline Speed Skating Championships in Italy. That will run August 26th through September 3rd. Aaron will also appear on season two of Special Forces, World's Toughest Text, on Fox, premiering September 25th. No way. I love this show. <laughs> yeah, You know who else is on the show? Tom Sandoval. So I met, Aaron hasn't answered me yet, but I messaged her if she could just punch him in the face for me. <laughs> Hit him with your skate, Aaron. And George Herthler has written an article for Olympics.com on Paris 1924 and Pierre de Coubertin. We will have a link to that in the show notes. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Yes, we are taping this at night tonight. <laughs> Bonne nuit. But yes, we do have news from Paris. A lot of people have been struggling to find hotel rooms. And Inside the Games had a story noting an investigation by Le Parisien that hotel rooms and Airbnbs are being increased up to six times the price that they are this summer. And the French government last week signed a bill requiring homestay platforms to advise users when prices advertised for accommodation are abnormally high. Are we surprised? No. No, and this is the case for any special event that prices get way increased because everybody's wanting a payday and there's a huge demand. We'll see what that demand is like as time goes on, like our friend Ken Hanscom always talks about. Some infrastructure news. A footbridge across the A1 highway between Dogny and Le Bourget in Saint-Denis it has been installed, and this will make it easier for pedestrians and cyclists to go back and forth between the sport climbing venue, the Stade de France, the Aquatic Center, and the Media Village. So it is not yet publicly open, but the big part has been finished, and that is good news. We will be so glad to see a building and be able to walk to it <laughs> and not be held captive <laughs> by the buses. Did I ever tell you? I don't know if this ever made the show. One time I went... Early on in the Olympics, I went to ski jumping and I got off the bus. It was another, it, this was out at Sai Chi Chen. So, of course, you took the bullet train. And when you got off, you had to take a bus to a bus. And when I got to that second bus stop, the ski jumping venue was just down the road a little bit. And uh, I asked where which direction it was. And the vo lovely volunteer said, it's that way. I'm like, oh, can I walk? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, I can walk? <laughs> and he said, yes. So I proceeded to walk uphill. But you were so happy to walk up that hill. Oh. You did not care. Oh, my goodness. I was so happy. That is very true. Very so true. I, I saw this, a, the bridge, and there's a whole story about the kind of wood that they used and where it came from. So I think there's a lot more history within this footbridge. But for us, we don't care. We will just be so happy to be able to walk between sites. And that probably will be the most efficient way mm -hmm. to get around because, yeah, there can be crowds, but I'm a little New Yorker. I can manage that. <laughs> and of the Olympic Broadcasting Service, or OBS as we like to call them, or OBS as they're more commonly known, has announced that it will provide 11,000 hours of content during the Olympics and Paralympics, and they will have more behind-the-scenes materials pre- and post-competition this time. They will also have more athlete-focused features, so I feel like they're taking a page out of the NBC playbook. I hope 
I mean, that sounds good, and it sounds like it'll be fun to be able to get to know different athletes, but I hope that, that doesn't take away from the feed. Agreed. And where those athlete focus features, are we going to get to see practices? And are we going to get to see some of those things when they're saying behind the scenes? Or is it going to be the packaged stories of my mother has cancer and I got injured and I'm here and triumphing overall? Right. I mean, who's OBS's version of Mary Carillo? The athlete de triomphe. <laughs> There are things that you can look forward to from the OBS coverage. They are going to use cinematic lenses for the first time. And this has shallower depths of field, which will better help convey the emotions of athletes. So that will be interesting to see. They will increase the number of replay systems that they will have. They will also have more dynamic graphics. So they called it live pinning. They also said biometrics data. So we've seen some of this in certain events like archery had heart rates going on. So there sounds like they're going to be, sounds like there's going to be more of this, which is really exciting. And then they will be filming some of the opening ceremonies from Boats on the Seine. They have developed three custom boats to help them film. We have a few friends at OBS. Do you think we can make some more friends and maybe get on a boat? We're small. We don't take up much space. (laughs) They can smuggle us on. We'll be stowaways on the OBS boat. Before the show, we were talking about Shelly Ann Fraser Price and how tiny she is. And that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons you love her and how her nickname is Pocket Rocket. And I know that we are both short, but there's no way neither, either of us are fitting in anybody's pocket. (laughs) This is true. We are not pocket rockets, but we are lovely on a boat. We we are lovely anywhere. Oh, Milan. Oh, Milan Cortina. We knew this was coming. We knew this was coming. I think we said the same thing two weeks ago or three. The last time we had Milan Cortina news, it was we knew this was coming. And this just keeps coming. And we knew this would happen. Big Everyone t- knew this was ha- would happen. Everyone who did not vote on 2026 knew this would happen. The only people who didn't seem to know this would happen is the people who voted against the Swedes. And am I still salty about this? Am I going to be salty for- about this forever? Probably. So the new news in Will Milan Cortina 2026 have any buildings yeah (laughs) thank you a little hat tip to rich perlman at the sports examiner for this one so italian national news agency ansa has reported that no company has bid to construct the sliding center at cortina d'empezzo now if you remember they had a sliding center there from 1956 it kind of felt it obviously over time stuff needs to be renovated It really wasn't renovated. It was closed. They were going to renovate it or they were going to tear it down. Oh, let's tear it down and we'll build a brand new sliding entertainment center. It will be wonderful. Nobody wants to build this. Meanwhile, costs for constructions have risen from $51.6 million in 2019 to $136 million million today. And the uh, Societa Infrastrutture Milano Cortina 2026 is now negotiating with potential contractors to get them to do this. That translates to begging. Right. Right? And, you know, if we're begging construction workers to this, you know, either it's not going to be good on, you know, who is getting involved with what construction companies will take on this project. And will the, are we going to fall into the same thing that we had with the Torino 2000, 2006 sliding track, which is lousy construction, and that's why we don't have a track in Torino anymore that we could have used as a backup. Now, the sliding track needs to really be finished by November 2024, which is next year because it's got to be ready for the test events in early 2025. I love the fact that Rich closed out his story with, well, you know, if you go to Innsbruck, it's only two and a half hours away. And San Moritz is five hours. 
Well, I mean, we have an event in Tahiti for Paris. I think we're okay going mm-hmm. to Innsbruck, two and a half. I mean, this Olympics is already spread out. We already have Milan and Cortina. Mm-hmm. How can you possibly justify a sliding center that's going to cost, when the time they're done, at least $150 million? Oh, at least. At least. And to call it an entertainment center, you're not going to have that many people taking them up on that entertainment. Let's be honest. You might get people training for sure because it's another place to go and train. But I don't I have a hard time seeing how it's going to make its money back. And speaking of things that don't have locations, I'm holding my head here because this is just I, I cannot believe we are having these conversations less than three years to go. The women's hockey tournament has now been moved to its third location, according to Inside the Games, a good article written by Owen Lloyd there. The tournament has been moved to the Fiera Milano Vro, which is a fairground complex, and the complex is hosting speed skating. And if you go, wait a second, wasn't speed skating supposed to be someplace else? Yes, it was. And it got moved there, too. Yeah, speed skating was going to be in a convention center after they couldn't get the money for the... Yeah, they were the... going to rent it. Well, this is the convention center type thing. It's a, it's apparently a fairground. I don't know if it's like what we would think of as a state fairground, but it looks like a number of buildings and not like a big convention center. Okay. <laughs> so the women's hockey previous location was called the Palisharp building, and it it had been abandoned in 2011 due to, quote, total degradation. And renovation work for that is now at a standstill, hence why they don't think it would be ready in time. You know what I think we're actually going to end up? We're going to end up with women's hockey and speed skating on Lake Como, (laughs) which would be beautiful. You know, just freeze it up. It'll be fine. Wow. (sighs) What a mess. mess. No, this is actually, you know, we joke about this, but this is actually really very concerning for this Winter Olympics because... 2030 hasn't been awarded yet. There's been a lot of issue with awarding 2030. And this doesn't help. No. And the fact that 2030 hasn't been awarded yet and we can't use old facilities. It's not like we can go back to Beijing and reuse some of the. We've got no backup. We have no plan B for 26. Right. Well, you know what the plan B could be? I'm sure. Well, it would be a bad plan B. It would be Salt Lake City. Because they are ready to go, basically. They are ready to go. They wouldn't want to. No. Just the, I think this is going to be worse than Torino simply because the Winter Olympics is now bigger than it was in Torino. So you have more events and more places for things to really go wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's awful because Milan is such a beautiful city and it deserves to be showcased. And the Italian Alps deserve the attention. The French Alps get all the sexy shots but the italian alps deserve to be traveled to and they're just blowing it and that hurts my heart yeah i don't know you there's gonna be a games they're gonna pull together something and put on a games but how it will end up it just all of the fallout after torino with buildings going unused the athletes village being pretty much wrecked Knowing that this is likely happening again, it just makes you sad. The athletes deserve better. I mean, when we talked to Kathy O'Connor, who was the doctor for the women's hockey team, and she was talking about the athletes' facilities being unfinished in a way that wasn't safe for them to be in them, Mm -hmm. like no hot water or walls crumbling. It's one thing to have taped up wallpaper like we talked about in Beijing, <laughs> it's another thing to not have hot water. Right. Do better. Do better, right, Milan. Right. You, uh, Get that Prosecco money, put it to good use. Maybe that's their plan, to just <laughs> fill us up with Prosecco so we don't <laughs> notice that the wall is crumbling and that there's actually no speed skating happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's time for Prosecco for me. So. It would work on us. That's right. That's going to do it for this week. Let us know what you think of Rhythmic Gymnastics. You can connect with us on Twitter and Instagram at FlameAlivePod. Email us at FlameAlivePod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348.
That's 208 Flame It. Be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. And don't forget to get our weekly newsletter filled with other fun stories about this week's episode. You can sign up for that at flamealivepod.com. I was reading the newsletter this week and I had totally forgotten about that Barbie doll with the tumble ring. Oh man, that's classic. So if you've had Barbie fever this summer, you've missed out on a good newsletter. So be sure to shine up for that. All right, next week, it's going to be one year to go to the Paralympics. Yay! (laughs) That means it's going to be one year closer to you sitting in a wheelchair rugby venue. (laughs) I'm so ready. (laughs) So we will be talking with sitting volleyball player Lo Nigrash. So you'll want to be sure to tune in for that. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.